So I'm Tristan, and my job involves a lot of staring at large tables of numbers. And often I want to do something like look at this column of latency numbers in nanoseconds and pick out some larger quantity like microseconds and milliseconds. And this used to involve counting a lot of digits starting from the right of the number. And I found myself doing this in all sorts of different places like my text editor and my terminal and Python notebooks and my web browser. And I didn't want to implement a solution for each of these places, but I came up with a weird solution that would work in all of these places, which is I could make a font that would insert fake commas into my numbers. And I could do this using font shaping, or at least I thought I could, because font shaping was really powerful. And I had seen all sorts of examples of really beautiful calligraphy and fancy Unicode tricks of various sorts. And so I have some examples here that I made by fooling around with the Unicode character palette for far too long, like this face here, made by combining characters to arrange things on top of each other. And so I thought I could do it. So I looked into the open type font shaping specification, which defines how all these things work. And so it says that things proceed in various stages controlled by tables within the font. So first, the characters in the string are mapped to glyphs, which are internal uh, things used by the font. And then glyph substitution rules in the G sub table are ran on them. So these replace various sequences of glyphs with various other sequences of glyphs, for example, to do ligatures by combining glyphs together into a specialized ligature. Then this sequence of glyphs that's had substitution applied to it goes to the glyph positioning step. And what this does is it positions glyphs on top of each other um, in the correct location so that your accents are, for example, above or below the character. And at this point, everything is still just internal IDs used by the font, and it needs to be rendered by the UI system. And in this case, it needs to be translated to outlines. And these outlines for each glyph are stored in a table inside the font. And I was reading through the specification, and I started to get a little worried because everything seems to work from the start of the string towards the end of the string. And I needed to work from the end of the number towards the beginning of the number. Luckily, at the very end, I found the reverse chaining contextual single substitution rule. And what this rule does is it acts kind of like a certain type of regular expression where uh, everything is a glyph class. And glyph classes are kind of like regex character classes where they match a set of glyphs that can be in a specific position. So there's the single position to replace and a glyph class of possible glyphs there and replacements for each of them, as well as look ahead and backtracking classes that match various uh, positions around that glyph. And this rule type was originally designed for a type of Arabic calligraphy. And it was actually meant for doing left to right shaping on that type of Arabic calligraphy. But Arabic calligraphy is a right to left context. So in order to do left to right, it has to work from the end of the string to the beginning of the string. So in my left to right context, that's exactly what I wanted. It would work right to left. So font designers don't actually use uh, the tables directly because there's some binary format. They use a language called font feature files, which compiles down to the tables. And here I have an example file. It has glyph class definitions at the top for lowercase and uppercase vowels. It says a feature that I want my rules in. These are just used for applying things in different orders or disabling and enabling things. And then it has my rules. My first rule takes finds a lowercase character next to another lowercase character and turns it into an uppercase character. The next rule takes an uppercase character next to an uppercase character and turns it into a lowercase character. And because these are reverse chaining, they start from the end of my string and make it so that there's no two cases next to each other. And so they alternate starting from whatever was at the end. And this kind of alternating capitalization is kind of like counting modulo two from the end of the string by using two different glyph sets. And we want to count digits from the end of the number. And we can use a very similar technique by using different glyph sets. But we only have one set of number glyphs. So what we need to do is create extra copies of the digit glyphs um, so that we can keep this state. Because the only type of state in this uh, substitution 
is by replacing glyphs. So we need as many glyph sets as we need to count glyphs. And as a digression, I decided that at first I didn't want to insert commas. I wanted to underline alternating groups of three digits. And the reason is that I wanted this to work in my terminal, which is a monospace context where every character has to be the same length. And inserting commas would mess up the fixed width tables and things like that. So in order to do this alternating underlining, I needed to count modulo six, because that's the periodicity of this alternating groups of three digits pattern. So I needed six different glyph sets, meaning I needed to add five extra ones. So this is how the first version of numbered align worked. The first character on the right of the number had no rules applied to it, staying as effectively glyph set zero. And then the next character after it had a reverse sub rule that matched a normal digit following a normal digit and turned it into a glyph set one digit. Another character over, a rule matched saying that a normal digit next to a glyph set one digit gets replaced with a glyph set two digit. And this chaining pattern matches, uh, continues over the first six digits, and then the seventh digit isn't matched by any rule and so stays as a glyph set zero digit. And thus, if I added more digits, the pattern would just repeat. And now that I have all my glyphs mapped to different glyph sets, I can then modify the outlines that are in the glyph table uh, to change the style of some of these glyph sets. So in this case, I add an underline to glyph sets five, four, and three. And this gives me my alternating underlining, at least in theory. Now I have to actually write code for it. And to do this, I had heard of this thing called the powerline font patcher, which adds extra characters to a font, which is kind of what I wanted. So it was a good starting point except for the fact that the font library it used crashed as soon as I tried to use a reverse subrule. And the reason is that it turns out nobody uses these reverse subrules, even for the type of Arabic calligraphy they're originally intended for. So they're broken in a few different places. Luckily, I did find a font library that did work. And so I had my tables that finally had underlines and alternating groups of three digits, making them easier to read. And so I went back to my original goal and I implemented fake commas by making some glyph sets wider and inserting a comma into the outline. I squished glyphs together to make this kind of visual grouping. And then I inserted little commas in between so I could have commas even in monospace contexts. Did other fonts, things like bolding, and then put them on a website for people to download and wrote a blog post. And someone saw this blog post and took it even further and wrote an implementation of FizzBuzz where it just adds numbered list elements and these kind of magically become uh, the correct FizzBuzz uh, things. And it does this by implementing the divisibility rules for three and five that are based on the digits of the number as font shaping rules and then basically implementing ligatures to replace those. Uh, I thought this was super cool. But I finally had uh, underlines in all my places, like my pandas notebooks at work. And this was great. Now, you might think, this is a horrifying hack, right? And I don't actually think it is. I think I'm kind of using font shaping for something that it's intended for, or, or the same kind of thing, in terms of it's taking a raw representation of the text and applying stylistic rules to make it it's more easy to read and visually pleasing. And that's exactly the kind of thing that font shaping is designed for. It's kind of hacky insofar as I'm using it on ASCII characters that nobody expects font shaping to be applied to. So various apps sometimes do performance optimizations to disable font shaping for Latin characters like Sublime Text and iTerm2. So I had to switch terminals to Kitty uh, to get it to work. But when it does work, it actually works really well and quite seamlessly, including like not having the fake commas when you copy the text. So I think this is actually pretty good. And I think it's a cool example of what you can do when you dive into a new level of the system that you might not have looked at before and find the right level to implement things. I could have done it in some kind of way involving some ANSI pattern matcher to work just in my terminal or a browser plugin, but I would have had to implement multiple different things and it just wouldn't have worked very well. And it actually would have been harder to do even after the time I spent researching font shaping. So I urge you to go and dive in and understand new areas of the system that you haven't seen before. Um, thanks, that's all I have.